Welcome everyone. I'm Joan Kerber Walker. Thank you for joining us for Leading Women, Bioscience and Beyond. This is an ongoing series we have each year during Arizona Bioscience Week. And we are thrilled to have once again, our hosts and partners from Perkins Coy. So with that, I would like to introduce Tyler Bowen, who is going to kick us off and introduce our moderator. Hello, everyone. I'm Tyler Bowen. I'm a partner at Perkins Coie. I've been in Phoenix practicing patent litigation for the past 15 years, nearly. When I started, I had a lot more hair. So you can see the, the toll that the stress has taken on me. Um, but we are delighted to once again be partnering with uh, Joan and AZ Bio to host this event, which I look forward to every year. Um, we at Perkins Coie uh, certainly value the contributions of AZ Bio to the state, and I, I love hearing the inspiring stories of the panelists every year. Uh, we as a law firm have offices that are scattered across the country and even in China and Taiwan, and uh, we, we've been active in the bioscience space, both in patents and in corporate, uh, for decades. Uh, and. We love to hear about the exciting things that are going on in the industry. And this year, I'm, I'm pleased to have my colleague, Helen Goldstein, who's here in the Phoenix office and will be moderating the panel. Uh, again, delighted to have everybody here. Uh, I hope, uh, against all hope, that we can do this again in person next year. And I can have my two daughters, who are now 13 and 11, who've attended this event in the past, come and join us in person. But I will be taking copious notes well, uh, our panelists are presenting, so no pressure on all of you. But with that, I will throw it over to Helen. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Helen Goldstein, and as Tyler said, I'm an attorney here in Phoenix, based at, at Perkins Coie. Um, I generally have a, a general practice, but I am absolutely passionate about life sciences. I love the complexity and kind of the, the end goal of of making people's lives better. It's a great area to work in. And the other area that I'm extremely passionate about is women's issues and something that I've worked on for a long time, right the way through college, all the way up to now being in the professional working world. Um, I'm so honored to um, be moderating the event tonight. And I'd like to start off by asking each of our very distinguished panelists to kind of give us a, a quick introduction overview and uh, of themselves. And then I'm going to kick off with some questions. So um, I think we'll start with uh, Jennifer. Would you like to start? Hi, I'm Jennifer Barton. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Arizona. And I also direct the Bio5 Institute. Perfect. And Vita? Hi everyone, I'm Invita. I'm CEO of AI Novo Biotech Inc. We are a startup working on using artificial intelligence to uh, revolutionize diagnostics and therapeutics for cancer. And uh, I graduated from Stanford with my master's and bachelor's in computer science and artificial engineering. Uh, I was born and raised in Arizona, so it is uh, exciting to be on this panel. And uh, I'm also very passionate about um, women's issues and inspiring uh, girls in STEM, and I, uh, when I was in high school, founded a nonprofit to help inspire young women in computer science. So, so that's something I'm very passionate about. Amazing, absolutely agree. Okay, hey, uh, Kathy. It is great to be here. Uh, nice to be with you all. I can't wait to be in person sometime soon. I am in Indianapolis, Indiana. I own a logistics company called Langham. We are the only woman-owned logistics company with GMP pharma storage and distribution in the Midwest and Southwest. We're in Phoenix. Uh, that also, we also have extensive cold chain transportation capabilities. So we've got about a million square feet in warehouses and about 170 people across the country. It's great to be here. Awesome. And the other Kathy, Catherine. Oh. <laughs> um, so I am, I am that person. 
Um, uh, my title is uh, VP of Research and Product Development at Calviri, which is a mouthful of a title, which I think exemplifies being a startup biotech where you, you do both the research and the development and the product and, and everything else. And so I think that's a kind of it's a good demonstration. It's a super exciting place to be um, and has given me the opportunity to take advantage of um, the time I've spent in a number of different uh, companies doing basically, I'll call it molecular gymnastics around biomedical health. Awesome. Okay, so I, I wanted to start off with um, Sandy, one of the areas which has been really interesting to me now that I've kind of been out in the professional world for a while, and that is mentorship, but also sponsorship. My understanding of mentorship is someone telling me that I'm awesome. Um, and my understanding of sponsorship is people telling other people that I'm awesome. Um, so I would love to hear from you as to kind of how mentorship and sponsorship has played out in your careers, maybe particular mentors and sponsors that, that you can tag who, who've had a particular influence. And also on a practical level, how did you, how did you go about developing those relationships? Um, maybe I'll start with Amvita. Yeah, uh, I think um, for me, uh, mentorship has always been extremely important in terms of finding out sort of more about the field of biotech and where specifically I want to go in the field. And then um, once I sort of figure that out, then taking the next steps on, you know, as a startup, how do we connect with the right um, you know, academics, professors to collaborate with, how do we connect with other large companies that might be interested in our product? Like who are the right people to talk to? So for me, um, you know, I have a number of mentors who are um, like for AI Novo Biotech, we have an advisory board and every, every quarter we have a meeting, go over everything that we've accomplished, sort of plans for the future and, uh, you know, get advice on a variety of different subjects from business aspects to more like science related aspects, because we do a lot of, you know, as uh, Catherine said, in a startup, you do the research development product, everything. So it's good to, you know, have those perspectives. Um, and yeah, I think that mentorship is definitely something that can be a long term thing, too. So it's important that you don't just sort of meet people and then fall off the grid. So for example, I've known Joan, who is uh, the president of AZ Bio since I was in high school and I had done a science fair in um, a science fair project on uh, using machine learning for drug discovery. And uh, I remember meeting Joan at the bio convention because I won uh, an award in the first place at the International Biogenius Challenge, which was a science fair. And, you know, that was sort of a, like a, chance meeting I didn't know I was going to meet Joan but like even so many years later we've still stayed in touch and I feel like I can ask her questions on anything that I um, have doubts about or I'm not sure about so I think that's one big thing like whether it's a mentor or a sponsor that's a long-term relationship and you have to make sure to check in with that person regularly and uh, build that over time. Perfect and um, Catherine Sykes what do you think? Yeah, so I saw, so I thought about this a little bit, and um, there have most definitely been both mentors and sponsors, particularly mentors along the way. Um, I, and actually, I wanted to share one of the most important comments I was ever, you know, statements. In fact, it was done in an argument, even, even better. Um, I was fairly young on and whining that I wasn't given um, you know, a project lead position in a particular company. And um, my boss, who would turn out to be an excellent mentor, you know, slammed his fist on the, his desk and he said, damn it, long before you are given the title of leader or leadership, you need to act like it. <laughs> And I think that was a really important statement. And it's particularly if you don't necessarily get the title right away, but you need to start acting like it right away. And then it, it follows, even if 
maybe in a different situation, it might have been easier to get or given to you on a silver platter or it's not. So then just act like it and it, it tends to eventually catch up with you. But the other comment I, I was thinking about that, you know, certainly reflecting on was the importance not of the mentor, but the anti-mentor and how much I have learned from um, interacting people who were, you know, were my senior, were my supervisors in some format or another, where I would say, gosh, he does not have my trust. He or she does not um, have my respect. Um, he or she is not credible. Um, why do I not trust that person? Why do I not respect that person? And reflect on, gosh, that's definitely how I want to not do it. And it's pretty powerful in the anti in the anti mentor format. Um, and so that's I think that's what I would take away. And that's so insightful, uh, Jennifer. So I, one thing I've noticed is that um, you know even at a university, the formal mentoring programs are kind of spotty, and they don't necessarily cover for everybody. So I would just encourage everybody who needs. Um, mentors definitely to just reach out and ask um, even if you are lucky enough to be in an organization that has a formal mentoring program that may just be one person or if you're lucky maybe a team but you need you need many many mentors um, and frankly I don't know if this is true of everybody but academics love to be asked what they think or asked for advice so you, you are never going to have anybody you know come up to you and say gosh you know I'm in this situation I'm not really sure what to do or what should I do here and, and you get people open arms. I think that's people. So I think anybody anywhere um, really should not feel hesitant at all about reaching out and asking for help and asking. You don't have to say, will you be my mentor? Just ask for advice and, and move on from there. And I think that would be really exciting. Um, and also don't be afraid to ask for mentorship from all kinds of people. You know, in fact, please do get a diversity of mentors and people you're getting your advice from. Um, and I think you know, at my age in engineering, I didn't have a whole lot of choice, but, but still uh, a lot of my very best mentors have been men. And I've, you know, deeply indebted to the deans of engineering that we've had, Tom Peterson, who hired me, Jeff Goldberg, who was dean for a long time, and, and now David Hahn, who's the current dean, have all been really fantastic about um, being sponsors as well as mentors. So reach out to people. They would, they would love to give you advice and mentorship. Fabulous. Kathy. Thank you. Really, really good comments. I appreciate those. And just maybe to add a, a bit of a different perspective. I, I think first and foremost, you need to be a great listener. You need to be very curious, whether it's with associates or senior managers or customers or wherever. You have to be curious about them and what they're doing before you can really spend much time asking them to do something for you. Uh, join something, just join and get involved. I don't care, you know, startup, startups, you have to do everything and you have to go um, network and join something. For example, uh, when I first started my business many, many, many years ago, I uh, also went to some chamber events and ultimately was the youngest board member to join the chamber and got my first public board experience from someone who was a chamber member that I met there and ultimately um, networked my way to President Bush visiting us and giving a, a speech from my warehouse. So it's, you know, it's just get out there and join something and, and get involved and be curious, be um, willing to uh, help somebody and, and you know, another perspective is how to be a good mentee. So I, I am not in the camp that you, you can ask somebody, please mentor me because a busy person, that feels like work. That feels like another thing on the to-do list. But if someone called me and said, hey, I'm going to bring in a grande, no fat, one raw sugar latte, and let's talk for 20 minutes. That sounds good to me. So think of, be thoughtful and uh, about how you approach somebody and uh, just, just be a good mentee for two. It's just absolutely amazing ideas, ladies. I am 
I definitely think that one thing which helped me become a better mentee was looking for people that I could mentor. I think as women, we often feel like, what, like, what do I have to offer? And the reality is that almost everyone has something that they can offer to someone else and learning to be a great mentor also helps you learn to be a great mentee and, and work out what works, what doesn't work. Okay, I want to I I want to kind of move on a little bit and talk about talk about women's leadership, particularly in the STEM field. Um, I would love to hear from you as to what you think continues to hamper women's leadership because I I think that we would all agree the statistics are still not on our side. Um, so what what do you think kind of continues to hamper women's leadership? And do you guys have any ideas? of what you might have implemented maybe personally or you've seen implemented to kind of break through those challenges or at least manage those challenges? Uh, Maybe I'll start with Catherine. Oh, I think it's just basically one word, confidence. Um, You know, I think a lot of people, boys, girls, you know, in high school are just simply scared by that word. Um, You know, you say STEM, it's like, oh, well, those are for the smart people. Well, you know, Sometimes I look at, you know, a symphony and say, oh, my God, uh, someone smart must have must have written that. <laughs> so, you know, it's all it's all a matter of perspective. Um, so I, I think it, 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 there's this people think that STEM must be hard as opposed to STEM must be interesting. And I have the confidence to maybe maybe not be good at it, at least at first. Um, I have the confidence um, to to explore, to explore what STEM is. That quote is going on my wall. (laughs) When you say STEM, STEM must be, uh, that that distinction, STEM must be hard versus STEM must be interesting. I I love that perspective. I'm Jennifer. So I have a little different thought. I actually thought about this for quite some time. And I think one of the things, um, this is particularly true in STEM, but it's true everywhere, is that um, we, uh, women have spent so long trying to get equality with men that we have purposefully put aside the fact that biologically women are different than men. Um, Let's face it, women bear the energetic burden, the vast majority of that, for the survival of the human race. We spend most of our lives bleeding every month. If we bear children, that's an enormous investment. And then we bear an infant that is helpless. And then just when you think that's maybe over, then you hit menopause and you have another whack to your brain um, that occurs at that stage in life. And um, these are things that um, do make women different. And we've kind of push them under the covers because we're afraid if we talk about them, then men will just say, well, that's why women shouldn't be in the workforce. That's why women shouldn't be in STEM. It's too hard. They can't do that. And, and I think that's a bunch of bunk. Um, I think, you know, the, the workforce situation has been set up for a particular type of worker. And many women have uh, just have, have, you know, they've, they've um, succeeded in that, but the workforce really could be much, much better. And it would be better for everybody if what we're done that way, if we realize that people are different, people need flexibility, the medical establishment needs to take women's issues seriously. We need to um, allow for things that can happen in people's lives. We need women in the workforce. They are different. That's why they need to be there. And so I really think that COVID, and we're going to get into that in a minute, I think, um, has brought up these issues of needing flexibility for many, many different types. And I think that's going to be wonderful for women. I think that's going to be wonderful for attracting more women into diverse fields, more diversity of all kinds into all fields, and helping promote everybody. Great. Kathy? Yeah, really, really good comments, Jennifer. And and I think COVID has changed a lot of things for for men and women, but especially for women with kids at home. Um, my perspective is this is another challenge. You know, we we've, we've got challenges, whether it's STEM or we have health issues or kids at home or you know, name something else. But 
you know, I'm thinking about uh, the young women in the audience uh, that are in STEM thinking about their careers and things are going to come up. You know, it is, yeah, whether we like it or not, there is still a good old boys network out there. And let's say something happens, whether you're not a golfer and the guys are playing golf or, you know, something goes on. I would recommend the first thing you do is look in the mirror and say, how am I interpreting this? And how can I grow from this and move forward and, and get out of your comfort zone a little network? Um, somebody said it, but, you know, go, go have lunch with someone or network with a boss or someone you even don't know. I mean, I have a little equation that I think about. Ability, you've got it, times motivation, get out of your comfort zone equals performance. So if you've got the ability, you, you've got to stretch yourself a little and make sure you're motivated and you're going to be a high performer and no one can ignore that. And Vita? Yeah, absolutely. I think there have been some really great comments made so far. I think from my perspective, I also see, you know, confidence has been an issue with, you know, young women who I work with. When I took my first AP computer science class, we had three fourths of the girls drop out of the class. So we started with eight girls and about 22 boys. And we ended up with two girls and like 20 boys. And so what was really confusing to me was that the girls who were dropping out of the class had higher grades than a lot of the boys who were staying in the class. And I'm like, you shouldn't be the ones dropping out in this situation. Like, obviously it's not based on the grades. So I was, you know, thinking about this and I um, started a club to help teach young women at my school um, computer science at earlier ages. And uh, I was shocked because we, we do pretty difficult exercises. You know, the girls would perform really well on them. And then there was this time they had to install a new program. And one of the best performing girls in the class was like, oh, I can't do this, I'm not technical. I'm like, what are you talking about? You've been through the whole class doing the hardest exercises. You know, how can you call yourself not technical at this point? And I think it's that perspective, you know, where you, you just have to, you have to have that confidence to say, yeah, I am a technical person and I can, STEM isn't much harder than anything else I've done. I've been doing it successfully so far. So I think that women and the world, you know, women have a tendency to be hard on themselves and the world has a tendency to be harder on women than that it is on men oftentimes. And so uh, it's some combination of those factors, a lack of confidence that I think really, you know, perhaps makes it harder for women to lead in STEM or become leaders. Um, and, you know, you have to look in the mirror and say, am I being too hard on myself? I, like objectively look at your performance, not how you feel and say, you know, I think I'm doing well compared to everyone else. And I think that I'm doing well compared to where I was before. That's another big thing, right? And uh, that will give you the motivation to keep going. And uh, I think, um, you know, that's one big thing. So you have to, I like the, what uh, Kathy said about motivation times ability. Because I think a lot of women have both and you just have to sort of uh, accept it and view yourself as a technical person. You know, STEM is not scary. It's not foreign. It's it's, you know, humans didn't have computers about 100 years ago. We're all pretty much on a level flank, playing field when it comes to that, at least. And so you have to sort of, uh, you know, think like I can do as well as anybody else and just motivate yourself time and time again to keep achieving. Right. Absolutely. I think one thing which I've certainly had a lot of students that I've been mentoring coming through kind of being, being told we live in a post-feminist world, you made it, we're, we're done now. And I think because we, we have done a good job in schools, um, sometimes of kind of a, a creating a level playing field, but suddenly when I hit the working world, realizing that it, it is not all rosy, um, was a little bit of a shock. And I remember someone telling me, you know, you're, you'll be okay, just be like a guy. You know, just be like a guy and you'll be fine. And I, I, one thing that I really try to bring to my practice is thinking like a girl, 
like thinking like a woman and one of the ways in which we're, we're seen as doing that is kind of being universal thinkers and being able to see the whole picture all at the same time. Um, and that's certainly been really helpful in, in a lot of the arrangements and agreements that I write that, and that I put together. Um, I wanted to move in, move, move on to kind of COVID. And I know it has been talked to, it has been talked to so much about. Um, I wanted to hear kind of how COVID is continuing to affect your work, but particularly kind of any creative workarounds or kind of interesting solutions that you've come up with for kind of the disruptions that you've faced. And I'm definitely going to start with Kathy on this one, because I know that logistics is hugely in the news right now. As you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from the UK where my parents right now cannot get gas or pretty much anything in the supermarket. Um, so I would love to hear from you, Kathy, to start off with kind of your perspective on this and kind of the ways in which you're dealing with the challenges that your industry is facing right now. Yeah, thank you for that. And and really just to provide a perspective that, that most of us have, but COVID shut down plants overseas. It shut down manufacturing in the United States and it everything has been a mess. I, if, if you're watching the news, hundreds of container ships off the port of Long Beach or you know off, off the port of New Orleans, anywhere is just, it's a mess. The, you know, pile on that, the Suez Canal debacle. Uh, there's a chassis shortage in the U.S. So even the, um, the chassis that the containers sit on once they get off the ocean vessel, uh, there's a big shortage of those and they're piled up. Uh, meanwhile, we're at home ordering more online and the worker, there's a worker shortage. And so they're not fulfilling those orders. So we've, we've really got a perfect storm, you know, and, and fun fact for the group, the median cost of a shipping container from China is now to the West Coast is now $21,000, which is twice as much as it was in July, which is twice as much as it was in January. So that's, that's how it's affecting the macro environment um, and by the way, by 2025, we have to have another 350 million square feet of warehouse and distribution space just for retail. So that's not API or raw materials for pharma or manufacturing or anything like that. That is just retail. So we, it's been a little crazy. You know, most of our workers are, were essential. So they were frontline warehouse, about 70 65 to 70% of my team are warehouse workers. So they were there the whole time. I was, I have never stayed home. I've been in my office the whole time. Just my teams were in their offices too. So we did a lot of things. We're still doing them. So every customer has an A team of Langham people and a B team. And that A team and P B team eat lunch separately. They use separate restrooms. Uh, if we're in groups, we're still wearing masks. You know, some of the creative things we've done is, of course, COVID pay for the people who are on, on site. And also a lot of, you know, we bring in ice cream about once every two weeks. We have chili cook-offs. We bring in lunch, pizza. We give everyone a bonus at the end of the year. So it's more, uh, you know, company meetings, a lot of video messages to the team. Uh, we have been very lucky that our turnover is, uh, has been very low. These people have been working. And I would say, well, I've heard statistics, you probably have too. I'd love to hear your feedback on this, that about 50% of mid-level people are looking for their next job and are changing jobs. So we will see a lot of that. We have to be flexible. You know, my folks that are home, customer service people and some accounting people, you know, no matter how much I, you know, would want to say, hey, get back to the office. We've got to be thoughtful. You know, we've got to change how we're thinking about it. I think Jennifer said it, you know, they have learned a new life and, and by the way, they're productive. So, you know, we've got, we business owners have to think differently about how we bring people back and we are, 
So we haven't brought the people back that don't want to come back yet. We're, and we're really, I guess, right or wrong, you know, as a small business, we're watching to see what Eli Lilly does here in Indy and Cummins Engine. And we're, we're sort of following the larger companies because, frankly, they're giving us some cover with our teams. Great. Uh, Jennifer, I know you're in academia, so that kind of is a, a different perspective on the, on the epidemic. Yeah, so COVID, um, it, you know, caused us like everybody else an immediate shutdown, but we have so many things here at the university that, that you can't leave. Uh, you know, you, you can't leave massive lasers. You can't leave uh, mirrors that are in the middle of being cast. You can't leave animals alone or cell lines. And so we had to very quickly figure out how to um, work under a COVID environment and I think we did it, you know, there was no magic formula. It was just a combination of a lot of the things Kathy already mentioned. We're still wearing masks. Um, we come in, we're careful. Uh, we don't meet in large groups together. And uh, it, it was remarkably effective. Um, there was transmission among the students, um, but uh, not, in the, not in a research environment. In the research environment, actually, I don't know a single case of anybody infecting anybody else um, in the lab. Um, so that that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, the thing we found that's really interesting at the Bio5 Institute is, is rethinking who needs to be on site. And one of the things that may be really extraordinary is wondering if people are productive at home. And I think we have to be very careful that we set up long-term structures so that people can continue to be productive at home um, and, and um, you know, the support and the monitoring they need to do that. Um, they don't need a desk. So the days of every single you know, one person equals one cubicle or one desk or one office, I think are going away. We may find ourselves with an awful lot of office space that we can repurpose if we have people at home. And, uh, you know, and then get people, we've, we've tried for um, decades to encourage people hoteling, you know, come in, sit down, sit down with a group that's not your own, learn something from people, mix up. Um, it's, that goes against human nature. People want their own space, but this may actually just make that happen where the people who work from home half the week and come in half the week um, do by necessity get mixed up and sit next to each other. And I'm actually kind of excited to see where that might, might lead. All right, Anvita? Yeah, for us, you know, from a startup perspective, we uh, ended up viewing COVID as an opportunity. So uh, we very quickly pivoted to seeing how our AI tools and technologies could be used uh, to design new proteins for COVID diagnostics. And uh, it was an opportunity for us to start forming a lot of collaborations in the diagnostic space. Uh, we had primarily been focusing on therapeutics before that. And so uh, that was an opportunity for us to work on a really important problem. And we made a lot of progress in the space too, which we're you know, continuing to test out um, on some of the newer variants of COVID that are now popping up. And uh, it was also an opportunity for us to then think about how we could use this new technology for cancer uh, which is an area we had been working on previously. So I think uh, in terms of work speed, definitely things slow down, especially in areas that, you know, like experiments need to be physically done <laughs> in person. Ultimately, like whatever you design on the computer, you do need to test it out in a lab. So that component slowed down, but it has started picking up very quickly this year. Uh, so that's been good. Uh, other than that, I think um, it was... It was, I, it did also help, I think, people in different areas connect much better than we had previously in terms of before to meet a professor, I'd probably need to be on person at campus most of the time. People didn't do video calls that much. Now it's second nature. You can connect with anyone over video call, no matter where they are in the world. Uh, so I think that's really helpful uh, for a startup. And I think it's really good for Phoenix too because the world is a lot smaller than it used to be before. Right, absolutely. Catherine, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that all of us here <laughs> have come to the same statement, which is um, um, we kept going. Uh, you know, we, we're in research, we're in the life sciences, you know, we have mice, um, you know, we have experiments, bench science, and so we kept going. 
Um, and also the, um, the comment that you made, Jennifer, that so we, you know, we were a startup, so it's a relatively small group and um, sort of like a, a family unit, if, you're, if I'm willing, if, if, the, if my team will let me say that. Um, so um, uh, everyone else in the building did stay home, but we had the bench science, so we kept going, but um, nobody infected each other. There was no case in which someone from the lab infected someone else from the lab. We were careful. Now, it did happen for sure that a, a couple of folks um, got COVID from their kids, from, you know, from the kids' interactions and stuff. And we lost them for a couple of weeks. And, you know, and we definitely had downtime from people thinking they might be exposed. So they got quarantined for a couple of weeks. And so that was certainly going on. The things did slow down. Um, the other one that continued, but th th that's sort of, you know, I, I memory is vac vaccinated now and it's largely gone, but uh, as a concern, but um, what's a lasting effect that, that you talked about, Kathy, extensively, and it's absolutely front and center with, with our company um, because real quick, real quickly, we use um, semiconductor wafers basically to build peptide chips for our diagnostics and, and vaccines. We got stuck really, and still continue to get stuck trying to get a hold of, of semiconductor wafers, um, as you can imagine. Um, so, you know, and all of the chemicals and reagents, we all love to be, call ourselves, you know, just in time inventory and how efficient that was. Of course, that's a absolutely crash and burn now. We have to order things way ahead of time. We have to, you know, pay for that. So we have in inventories because we think we might need it before we can get it again. And so not nearly as disastrous as the Longshoremen or what's going on in Los Angeles and Long Beach and, and all over the world. And um, But um, we, we will continue to ha be a world of a completely different um, supply chain and manufacturing JIT is just something of completely history. Fascinating. Right. I mean, I, I think one one area that, that I saw come alive for me during the pandemic was watching the collaboration in the life sciences space. So once every two weeks, the beginning, the FDA would do a call in um, where, where they would discuss COVID testing. And they covered topics right from 3D swabs 3D printed swabs kind of all the way through to the latest technology, listening to the questions and the dialogue between the FDA and suppliers all around the world, just having this very dynamic discussion as to how to solve a problem. I think that the life sciences industry just absolutely came together and, and really shone through, it was amazing. Okay, I want to I want to tackle one more question, um, and then we'll see whether our audience have questions. If we don't, I have plenty more that I would like to ask. Um, I'd love to hear from our panelists some opportunities that you have in in your businesses or potential synergies that you're looking to develop that might be of interest to our audience. So particular relationships that you're looking to develop, particular gaps that you have that you feel someone might be able to fill. So um, I'll start with Kathy. Thanks, good question. And uh, Catherine, just one comment. We have gone from just in time to just in case. Oh yeah, right, right. And, and that's more expensive for sure. <laughs> I, it, it's expensive and yeah. Um, so uh, what do we need? It, you know, I, as I first, you know, considered a, a question like this, we're always looking for great people. I mean, for any of you that are looking for roles uh, in logistics, supply chain logistics, or I'm sure biotech, uh, it, you know, it sounds simple, but communication skills, someone who is, can write well and speak well uh, is, uh, is ideal, uh, great attitude, willingness to do whatever it takes, uh, appreciation for their role and where they're going and their team and their customers. So, yeah, I mean, just this attitude of appreciation and 
caring about each other is, it, it, I, I feel like they can learn the rest. Now, if you're there, which you, most of you hopefully are, then it's technology. You know, we are implementing labor management systems, drone technology, uh, automated put away uh, of pallets, um, Procuro uh, procurement and purchasing software. So any, any technology, I would say technology and communication. Uh, I, I have a 22 year old son and I tell him, if you can do that, if you can communicate well and you have high technical skills, uh, you're, you're gonna go wherever you want in this environment. Thank you. And Rita? Yeah, um, I definitely second that we're always looking for great people. So uh, if anyone is in this call and interested in, uh, in a very interdisciplinary startup in artificial intelligence, biotech, where you can make a real impact, then absolutely uh, reach out. Uh, the other thing is that we're always looking for um, uh, organizations to collaborate with that want to uh, pilot some of the work that we've been doing. So we have a lot of interest from very diverse fields. We have interest from large vegetable seed companies in our products. We have interest from hospitals, from uh, doctors who are doing uh, cancer diagnostics because our work in artificial intelligence and protein design is very, very, has a lot of applications. Uh, so if you have a, a particular area in which you would like to improve your work using artificial intelligence within biotech and within sort of this area, then of course, I uh, would love to connect with you, so. Catherine? Hi, yes. Um, we're, you know, we're relatively small, but, but our group is growing very quickly and, at, but at the same time, very carefully, you know, what, what we're really and and our our management team is very much on the same page about this is we want to bring people on that are going to stay with us and grow with us. We don't like turning people. We don't turn people over. We you know we grow them. They grow with us. And um, some of the people, I mean, most of the people that we have hired, you know, we're at you no know, no. We're only talking twenty people, so it's relatively small. But so they've been with us from the beginning, or they've joined more recently and have stayed. I mean, and I, I think that how that happens is they have bought into our mission, um, and I think that's a really yes. They have to be smart. They have to have an expertise, and they have to be driven. But they also have to be driven for what. Um, the company is trying to do, and I think that's a really important part. Is that they say this is this is my mission, also not just the company's mission, and this is our our you know um, our, sorry for being sappy that our our family. This is this is who we spend all our time with. Um, gosh, you know, um, and uh, we we want to to take care of them, and uh, it, I think it, it it shows in performance. Great, uh, Jennifer. Bio5 Institute has three missions. One is interdisciplinary research excellence. So that's mostly getting people together within the university. But then our second one is to translate all that good stuff that we develop in the laboratories out into the community, into the marketplace, uh, into the clinic. And so there we're always looking for people who are in uh, Arizona, especially, but around the world um, who are interested and think, hey, maybe there's something at the university, whether it's a piece of equipment we could use or an expertise I need, uh, please contact me. That's what I, one of the things I do is, is act as that interface. And the third thing is um, helping to mentor the next generation of scientists and engineers. So. Right now we have our Keys High School Internship Program. Applications are open. So um, please, if you know anybody who's uh, 16 years of age or older in high school who's interested in getting a, a summer experience, hopefully in person next year um, at the University of Arizona, I encourage them. Um, at, it's just at keys.arizona.edu. Perfect. Okay, so I'd love to open it to the floor if you have questions you can put them straight into the chat for me uh, we have about 10 minutes right now so um, I'll start with um, a question how do you personally evaluate your leadership abilities 
and how have you changed over time to be a better leader? So I'm going to open it up to my panel. Who would like to take this one? I'll, I'll weigh in. Uh, Otherwise, I was going to have think to think about it. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, everyone on this panel, um, uh, we are the last ones paid, you know, we, we, uh, we make money after everyone else is taken care of and their families. You know, when I think about my business, I, I feed 170 families. So with that in mind, um, you know, it, it you can be a little hard charging, maybe a little too hard charging for some people. Um, and, and I think over the years, what I have learned is uh, everyone, their personalities are different and they operate a different way and um, learn to be a little, a, a better listener and a, a more compassionate leader. So still goals in mind and still we've got customers to serve, but uh, a, a little uh, uh, slower to take action maybe and, and make sure I'm listening and understanding what people are trying to communicate to me. I'm getting better. <laughs> Catherine, do you have any input on this one? Oh gosh. Um, I hate evaluating myself. I don't do that to me, Helen. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. I won't. I won't. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think I've tried very hard to take the advice and anti-advice, as I was saying, you know, at the beginning of the hour. And I, I think I've made progress. I think I've made progress. <laughs> Jennifer? I'd encourage people to take advantage of any formal programs they can. Uh, I finally, you know, after serving as interim vice president for research and a department head and um, Pile 5 director, I, I had the opportunity to go to a, a formal leadership program. Now, this is probably more than most people want to get into because it was a year-long process, um, but there's, there's smaller opportunities as well. But one of the fun things that almost all of these do is a 360 evaluation where they ask your, um, you, your, the people you report to, they ask your peers, they ask students, they ask other people about you. And boy, is that eye-opening because I think I listen and I think I know and I think I'm pretty self-aware and I know what people talk about me and there's stuff that came out of there that I went, oh, okay, um, good and bad. You know, it's, it's, it's an ego boost in a lot of ways, but there were a few things in there that were, I realized I really needed to work on. And so um, it's, it, yeah, it, it, listening, getting informal advice, uh, listening to your mentors and your mentees, but if you can, you know, either just through an organization or, or any program that your company or institution might have, um, I would encourage people to get formal feedback. And Rita, do you have anything to add? Well, I think I'm still pretty early in this process of learning, <laughs> but I think even so, um, one thing I have noticed is uh, I think that you really are a better leader if you connect well with the people you're leading and you understand where they're coming from and you take time to talk not just about business, but other things. So uh, that's definitely been a more conscious effort on my part where it's like, you want to be a good leader, but it's not just like, okay, this meeting, we're going to do A, B, C, now go, you know, you do have to like sort of um, make sure that you're connecting with people, understanding what drives them, you know, and really being not just like a, like a manager, but to be a leader, I think you need to have and convey a vision to the people you're leading. So I think that's one big thing. Right. Absolutely. Um, here's another question for you. Can the panel speak about a time they addressed a sexist policy in an institution? Were they in a leadership position at the time? And were there repercussions for speaking up? Who would like to take this one? Um, I, I think I heard the question. I think, uh, think of a time where you have addressed a sexist issue mm -hmm. in an organization and how you handled it. Yeah. Um, I, I would say I, I was on a um, public board a few years ago and, and there was an issue with one of the executives, not with me, but with some employees. And 
I chaired NomGov. So, I mean, it, it sort of, the governance fell squarely in my lap and um, I, I had to part ways with the executive. I mean, I, I had to go to the board and, uh, you know, make, inform them that now that I have been made aware of this, that we have to take action and we did. So, yeah, I mean, you, once you're aware, right. uh, you really have to do something. Um, I, I'll give you an example. I, I worked in a nonprofit and um, we they invited um, a group of a group of women who worked in the grassroots of this nonprofit of which I was one to a conference. And um, the, the panel was a, a group of men and they deigned to mansplain to us exactly what we wanted. Um, we were running a number of missions to international countries and, and they decided to tell us that, well, the, the women won't want to go, right? You, I mean, why would you want to schlep halfway across the world, you know, and leave your kids and family behind? We just assume that you didn't want to go. And um, I was sitting in the audience and I, I, I stood up and I said, it's not true for me. I, I want to go. And then I said, and I call on the women in the room, would you please stand up if you would also like to go? And the entire room stood up. And it was, uh, it, it was a moment of realization for, for this group of men deciding to tell us what we would and would not like. Um, so certainly, I, I think it's oftentimes you call on your sisters um, and, and turn around and say, do you know what? Like, the, let us tell you, let us speak to you about what we want and our needs. And does any, anyone else in the panel have something they'd like to add? I do think this gets back to being a sponsor. Um, one of the things that, um, I, you know, one of the nice things about the university is we're an academic, right? So there was a whole academic um, program to see whether or not there was a systemic uh uh, discrimination against women um, in terms of, of salary and space and things like that. And, and no surprise, there was. This was done many years ago and the university has tried but it to, to make things better and uh, they've made huge strides, but it is an ongoing process. And so I think one of the things that, that I try to do is while being respectful of people's time, if I see high visibility opportunities for them to serve on a panel that to me does not look like it has a good balance of diversity in any way, um, then I recommend people to get on that panel. Um, I also sometimes, just to be clear, recommend that people not serve in service positions where I don't think they're gonna make a big impact because otherwise, um, you know, the, when you're in a field where there's not very many women, you get asked to sit on a lot of stuff to be the diversity voice. Um, so you have to be careful about that. But I think, you know, just it's, it's not that much different than what you said, Helen, is, is asking, you know, the other women to stand up and say, yes, you know, my, I want my voice to be heard too. Right. I think that tokenism has certainly become, also become an issue in, in our field, certainly with the uh, more mandates coming out of having, for example, a certain number of women or minorities on boards, there's only a question there as to whether or not that just becomes a token and there are a few women who are serving in those positions or whether it, it's actually bringing diversity to the board. And I think the only way that we can do that is by, by encouraging as a, a many, many more women to step forward and, and join, join this, this industry and, and work towards those leadership positions. I am looking forward to the day when I am when when I am in a majority on a call of women. I'm usually the the only girl on my corporate calls. Um, so looking forward to getting to a point at which which we've really kind of got got to got to a numbers uh, numbers equality so that you don't end up with that tokenism. Um, we, we only have a few more minutes left, so I would actually like to kind of open it up to closing comments. And one thing that I like to do um, whenever I leave one of these sessions is I'd love to ask people to put into the chat um, all of the audience. Um, maybe one thing that, that you found that was memorable from this panel, just one idea, um, just so that people can kind of see what other people have taken away from 
from this and kind of jog people's memories as to what they thought was impactful. So love to open it to our panel to kind of closing comments. So um, I'll start with Catherine. Okay, closing comments. I, I, I think each of us have brought some important points um, along the way. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to see the attendees um, try to capture that um, um, for the rest of the attendees, but also, you know, Je Jennifer, back to your point, you know, uh, the 365 thing, I, you know, I, I would love to hear what you guys think is important um, and you know, to let us see that and potentially even, you know, um, reach out to you uh, if it was something that we thought would might be helpful. So, you know, please use the chat box. Um, I look forward to, to looking at them um, personally myself. Mm -hmm. And I know also there's some questions that we didn't get to. So um, I'll, I'll try and collect those and uh, see whether we can't find a way to give you some answers to some of the questions that we didn't get to. Um, and Vita, do you have some closing comments? Yeah, closing comments. Uh, I always love being on panels like this because I feel like I learn a lot from the other speakers as well. So thank you all for that. It was really awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, I think closing comments, I think it's a great time to be in bioscience. It's a great time to be a woman in STEM uh, and it's a great time to be a leader as well. And I think everyone in this panel is a wonderful leader uh, in many different ways. So, uh, you know, if you are a woman in bioscience or you're interested in bio bioscience, you're in the right place at the right time. So keep working hard. Uh, don't be hesitant to go out of your comfort zone. You don't regret the opportunities you take. You usually regret the ones that you didn't. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, with that little platitude, <laughs> I will uh, leave you. So thank you so much. Right. Not leave you, but I'm still here. But yes, yeah. <laughs> Jennifer. Uh, I, I think what Anvita said, right? You know, <laughs> step out of your comfort zone. D don't overthink things too much. Um, go, go do something interesting and and stay flexible. You know, I'm. I hate to say it, but I'm getting to the age now where um, you know I have kids saying, "Oh, you're so old. You just don't understand." Um, so, you know, I, I grew up at a time when when women in engineering were were rare. Um, when there maybe wasn't overt sexism anymore, but that time had maybe just passed. Um, and you really did have to fight and wear the, you know, wear the suits with the shoulder pads and the silk ties and look like a man. And, um, you know, things are, are getting better now, but there's still so much work to do. And I saw we had a comment in the um, chat about transgender. I mean, there's many, many more issues of diversity that we haven't covered here today. And we all need to be, you know, in, in the end, it comes down to making sure that every single valuable and diverse voice is heard and recognized and respected and just keep striving. Beautiful, Kathy. Yeah, I, I was thinking, what advice would I give my 30 year old self? <laughs> I, I, I think, you can create your role in any company. Just know that, especially a small business. I mean, every single new person that we hire has a massive impact on the future of the company. So don't, it really, I, I mean, I tell people, don't even be afraid what, which company you go to because you, you will learn a lot and you'll make a difference. So just be a sponge, learn everything you can, work hard and be open to mentorship like we talked about and and just repeat after me i am awesome i am awesome i am awesome i mean every morning tell yourself that and if my 80 year old self was talking to me she'd say have fun enjoy your family and your life and and don't make it all work so that's my parting advice Fabulous. I'm, I'm so glad you brought it full circle because that's what I started off by saying in the beginning that mentors tell you you're awesome and sponsors tell other people you're awesome and I mean the panel this evening has I and I don't mean this in a, any kind of glib way really been awesome I, it's incredible to see the contributions that all of you women are making to the industry um, and in your respective fields really saving people's lives, make it, making people's lives better. It's 
it's a privilege to be in this industry and it's been a real privilege to serve as moderator on this panel. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Joan. Thank you so much, Helen. And to our panelists, you guys all rocked it. Thank you very much. And um, you know, one of the things that I have found is that women are supportive, right? It's in our DNA, as, as Jennifer alluded to, um, in the ways that women are different. And every single one of you, when I asked if you would be willing to help, everybody stepped up, everybody engaged, and most importantly, everybody did all the work so I didn't have to because they knew I was busy. So thank you all for just an amazing discussion. Um, also, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna embarrass some of our panelists right now. So um, Helen has been recruited to work with our AZ Bio peers um, groups, and um, she's got some incredible experience that she'll be sharing throughout the year. Um, Kathy, you know, she talks about starting her little business. She has grown that business to a nationally recognized leader in the field. And um, Kathy, kudos to you for doing that. Um, Anvita got to meet me at Bio, but not long after that, she was shaking hands with the president of the United States. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about the scary, smart next generation, I think of Anvita. Um, Jennifer and Catherine, um, talk about getting roped into things. Both of them are stars of Celebrating Life and Science, which premiered on ABC on Sunday and um, is now on the AZ Bio website. So if you go to azbio.org under the events tab, you will see the video of Celebrating Life and Science and make sure you look for Catherine and Jennifer. Um, and with that, um, as a reminder, we did record this session. I saw a couple of comments in the chat about, oh, I'm so sorry that so-and-so wasn't able to be here. Well, as soon as I get this video edited, we will get it up on the AZ Bio website and you are more than welcome to share with all of your friends. So this is not the first discussion we've had about women in leadership and it will not be the last. But we truly appreciate all of our panelists and all of our audience for joining us tonight. And we look forward to the next um, Leading Women Bioscience and Beyond session during Arizona Bioscience Week. And we really hope it will be in person. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you, Joan. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.